All right, well, continuing and almost finishing the Holy War this evening, we'll have one more uh, lesson in the Holy War uh, before we'll conclude the book. Uh, but you recall that where we are in the narrative, that fellowship has been restored between redeemed Mansoul and their Lord and Savior, Prince Emmanuel. Uh, fellowship, communion between them was, uh, was broken for some time because of their sin and foolishness in becoming friends with carnal security. And you remember in becoming friends with him, they became such as he. They became carnally secure, secure in themselves and not in their prince, not in Emmanuel. Uh, but now at last their hearts and minds were fixed on him and his ways and through much struggle and sorrow and fighting against Diabolus who sought to retake them over, but they have fought for the truth to the glory of their prince. They have, they have stood for the truth to the glory of their prince. And Emmanuel has come back to the town to reign, uh, defeating Diabolus and his army of doubters in the process, and bringing with him much joy and peace and comfort back into the city, much joy and peace and comfort that comes from his presence alone. And that is true of the believer. That is true of the born-again believer, that their joy, their, their comfort, their satisfaction comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Now, we can do all things through Him who strengthens us as He who is the bread of life sustains us and is our contentment, regardless of what we're going through, regardless of whether we have or have not, or are abounding, or uh, are brought low. We can be content in all things because of Christ, who is our joy. In His presence is the fullness of joy. The right hand of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ are pleasures forevermore. And while this has happened with, with Mansoul, you remember just as the devil did to our Lord in tempting him, he, how he departed from our Lord until an opportune time, Luke says there in Luke 4. So has Diabolus done this to Mansoul. Beloved, there's a constant battle against sin. There's a constant battle against our own flesh. There's a constant battle against this world and, and, and Satan who, who runs it, who seeks to lure and entice us in accordance with sinful desires that remain in our flesh that we must put to death. And, and we're not done with this fight until the Lord returns or he calls us home. And we saw that continuing fight last time as Diabolus marched back to Mansoul with another army of doubters along with those who are called uh, the blood men, you remember, with them. You remember the blood men were filled with vicious hatred and the desire to be evil and hurtful. And what we saw as we examined, when, examined them was that they represented the, uh, those who persecute believers, those who persecute Christians, uh, the godly. Uh, it was these same ones, the blood men, whom you remember from the mouth of Diabolus, said that, that forced... It put quotes around that, that forced Prince Emmanuel out of the kingdom of universe. Remember talking about uh, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they, didn't, they didn't force him. He willingly laid his life down. But they did, uh, for a time, put him out of the kingdom of universe. And beloved, just as our Lord taught in John, uh, in John 19, verse 20, if they persecuted him, they'll persecute us as well. Right, a servant is not greater than, the, than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you as well. The blood men came after him. They're going to come after us as well. Uh, the world whom we were once aligned with before we were converted, they hate truth just as we did before we were converted. They hate truth. And because of that, they hate the Lord of truth and, and his followers uh, who, who live in and actually walk in and, and proclaim his truth, actually uh, seek to live a life uh, of godliness and following Christ. They hate that. Thus, all who desire, we're, we're promised, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12. In some form or fashion. Doesn't mean everyone who lives a life of godliness in Christ Jesus is going to be, is going to, you know, die a martyr's death or something like that. But you're going to suffer persecution in some form or fashion. You're going to have some opposition from the world in some form or fashion against truth. If we were of the world, the world would love us as its own. But because we are not of the world, but he has chosen us out of the world, therefore the world hates us. John 15, verse 19. Well, though that is true, saints, there's, there's nothing they can do to stop our Lord and his sovereign will for his glory and the salvation of his church. 
uh, though he was put to death, as, as I've already said, it was actually he who, in orchestrating all the events in his world, uh, he, it was he who laid down his life voluntarily. Uh, you, you read several times through the Gospel of John. They were trying to kill him, but it was not his hour. But it was not his hour. When it was his hour, when he chose, he laid his life down. No one takes his life from him, John 10. He lays it down of his own accord. He let them kill him for the salvation of his people. And afterwards, he took his life back up again to the glory of the Father. Uh, nothing will stop the Lord Jesus, and as he works all things together for the good of his people, such is the same even in our persecutions, even in opposition from the world, or even those who profess to be in the faith. Further, you remember that as the battle started, Mansoul cried out to their prince to save them from bloody men, to which Prince Emmanuel commanded certain captains to secure the sides of the town where the blood men had set up camp, and he raised his banner on the battlements of the castle, uh, the heart of man. Just as the Lord Jesus does for us, he, he's strengthening, strengthening them to, to endure this assault, uh, to persevere through this assault. He's not just taking them out of it. Right? He's not just taking them out of the hard circumstance. Certainly our God has all power to take us out of any hard circumstance there is. But many times, beloved, it's not the circumstance that needs to change in our walk in the Lord. It's our heart that needs to change. It's our thinking that needs to change. Many times he doesn't take us out of the circumstance. He gives us the power and the strength and the wisdom to endure through it. Where we can say with David, I'll, I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Why? I can walk through that because he's with me. Because, because I've, I've learned from my Lord to trust in him in all things. So he didn't just take them out of it, but as his grace is sufficient for them, he, he strengthens them to persevere. And then we concluded last time in speaking of Captain Self-Denial, you remember. Uh, Bunyan tells us that these fights with the blood men came with many long and, and fierce assaults, and there were those who were, who were wounded. There were many uh, in the townspeople who suffered from these assaults from the blood men, and one of those was Captain Self-Denial. That's certainly one thing that can, can get greatly tested uh, when we are under opposition and when we are under persecution. We're actually being tested in the faith. That's one thing that can greatly be tested is our self-denial. Uh, will we seek the love of self over the love of Christ? Will we seek to back away from the truth for self-preservation? Will we seek to back away from the truth so the persecution will cease? Oh, well, you know, well, it's not really that, that big a deal anymore. So, so they'll stop? So they'll stop coming against you? Will, will we seek the love of self so that we can preserve self over glorifying our God and the truth? Or will we continue the course and will we deny self for truth and the glory of Christ? And love for neighbor so that they won't believe this, this falsehood that they're seeking to come against me for. Beloved, as followers of Christ, we've been called to deny self to take up our cross daily die to self daily and follow him. That's what he said. If you would come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, die to yourself daily, follow me. Not die to yourself, but then still follow yourself. Follow me how you want to. Follow your feelings. Follow your own opinions. No, he says, follow me. No, we greatly need to be reminded of this. We constantly need to be reminded of this. And we are through this captain who, though he did suffer with battle scars on his face and body, he greatly risked his life for the good of the town and led many raids against the blood men. Right? He wasn't just seeking himself. He was seeking the embitterment uh, of others. That's a proper self-denial. Denying self for the embitterment of others. Not purely seeking our own interest. Even if it means that there's discomfort for us in the process. Even if it means that we get some scars on our face and so forth. Denying self, actually loving neighbor as God has created us to. Continuing in the narrative this evening, going out and continuing in the context, uh, Bunyan tells us, and I quote, Mansell spent some time in this trial of their faith and hope, but the prince loved the town, and one day he called together the captains and their soldiers and divided them into two companies. He would launch an offensive against the troops of Diabolus early the next morning. One company was to attack the doubters, while the second company was to attack the blood men. And here's the order. The captains were ordered to kill the doubters, but to take the blood men alive and to kill none of them. Close quote. And, and honestly, that command intrigued me in, in reading it uh, and thinking about why Bunyan would have Prince Emmanuel order the doubters to be put to death, but not the blood men. Why wouldn't he have the blood men killed as well? 
the only thing I could find on it, I tried to, you know, look in different things. I couldn't find anything on it. But the only thing I could, I could find on it was in my translation of the book because there are some questions and, and study notes at the end of each chapter in, in, in the book that I have. And it actually said, in, it asked, like one of the questions was this, is why, why weren't they to kill uh, the blood men? It, it said that since the blood men represented those who persecute Christians, uh, that God alone controls what happens to them. So they weren't to kill them because they represent those. They represent actual people. Um, and so essentially the, the initiative to kill them uh, shouldn't be taken. And, you know, I don't know for certain if that is what Bunyan meant by having Prince Emmanuel commanded, command that. I don't know if that's why he wrote that. But I'll respond to that statement in saying, yes, God does control uh, what happens to them. But he's also controlled in revealing in his word that if people are murdering or seeking to murder others, then they should die. Then they should be killed. Uh, they, they, if you're seeking to take life, your life should be taken. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Genesis 9-6. So it doesn't matter who it is. Uh, if, if someone or a group of people are trying to break in here to murder us because of what we're doing and teaching in here, uh, let's say there's blood men trying to come in and, and they're trying to, to murder people in here. Uh, I don't care who it is. It doesn't matter if it's the government or, or anyone. Uh, it, it doesn't matter who it is. I and others here, I would assume, would seek to kill them before they could kill us so that nobody would be killed here, so that no one would be murdered here. I would say that's the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah to, to kill. That's, that's loving the neighbor. It's not loving to just let people die around you, to let other people be murdered uh, around you. Uh, and in such a case, I'm not going to be worried. As the command to Mansell, I'm not going to be worried about figuring out how I can trap these people and take them alive because their whole thought process is, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to murder you. And even if we did, they would still be condemned to death under God's law. What they meant to do to us ought to be done to them. Uh, murderers are to be put to death. So in that, you know, there's nothing wrong with self-defense. Uh, with, with defending yourself and so forth. The Lord Jesus himself even told his disciples on the night of his betrayal that if they didn't have a sword, they ought to go buy one. Uh, that's Luke twenty-two thirty-six. They didn't have a sword, they ought to go buy one, and that wasn't so they could walk around and, and look cool and tell other people, hey, look at my sword. I mean, that's, that's for defense. That's for defending themselves. Uh, and in that as well, there's nothing wrong either with nations or kingdoms of people coming together and protecting those within them from outside threats or even inside threats, seeking to kill them, seeking to kill their citizens or something like that, uh, which that is a part of what God has ordained governments for to begin with. In those first verses of Romans 13, the Apostle Paul tells us very clearly that governing authorities are God's servants and avengers who carry out God's wrath on wrongdoers, and they do not carry the sword in vain. They're God's ministers to, to carry out his wrath on wrongdoers here and now. They don't carry the sword in vain, meaning they do not carry the authority to put people to death for nothing. They don't, they don't carry the sword in vain. And in such a case, when you have people seeking to harm others, the governing authorities over that land have the duty and the right to uphold justice and protect those within them by carrying the sword against those coming against their people for harm. Right? That's, that's love for neighbor, not allowing my people to be harmed, not allowing my people to be taken advantage of uh, and, and killed and so forth. That's love for neighbor. So, again, I, I don't believe there's any warrant to say that these blood men shouldn't be killed just because they represent actual people, especially since they're seeking to kill Mansoul and, and bring them harm. Uh, but, nevertheless, that's what we have in the narrative. And, again, I don't know exactly what Bunyan meant by that, if he didn't mean that. But, nevertheless, the orders are given. Uh, the, the doubters are to be killed, the blood men are not. Captain Good Hope, Captain Charity, and their men were joined by Captain Innocent and Captain Experience and their men to uh, fight against the doubters, while Captain Credence and Captain Patience with Captain Self-Denial and the men under their command were to attack the blood men. And interestingly enough, the doubters, in remembering what had happened in their last confrontation with the troops from Mansoul, once they saw them coming, uh, they just ran from the prince's men. Uh, they just fled the scene. They just saw them and, and, and hit the road. 
They didn't even try to fight or anything. Uh, the blood men, however, in seeing the prince's troops, they jeered at them, right? so uh, laughed at them, sought to taunt them. They jeered at them instead of fearing them, thinking that they planned all this without their prince. And as the other troops who were pursuing the doubters arrived, all of Mansoul's troops together surrounded the blood men, and they were all captured. Um, that's, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it with the blood men. It was that easy. Um, they just surrounded them and, and captured them, and that was it. Some of the blood men actually asked for mercy from the prince and received it. Certainly all who truly call upon the name of the Lord for salvation will be saved regardless of what we have done in our lives. Uh, our sin cannot outweigh or hinder the great grace of God to save in Christ Jesus. He will save all whom truly come to him in repentance and faith in him. Thus, they asked for mercy, obviously, truly from the heart, and they received it. They called upon him and received it. While the rest who did not ask for mercy and would not repent were put into prison to answer for their crimes against Mansoul and their king Shaddai at the great and general court to be held by our Lord the king Shaddai, where every man will answer for himself. And certainly they will. Every man will answer for himself at this uh, great and general court held by our Lord, the King Shaddai. Uh, that's speaking of the judgment of our God on every man at the last day, when the Lord Jesus returns and we will stand before him in judgment for how we have functioned as his creations, created to function a certain way. And in not doing so, uh, we will stand before him rightly condemned, apart from being saved by Christ and having his righteousness credited to our account. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. These, are, th these books represent God's knowledge of our life, of our thoughts. Romans 2 says, even the thoughts of men, secrets of men will be judged by God in Christ Jesus. And, and these dead here, uh, we're a part of that, right? That's all of us. You know, sometimes people talk about the people in the Bible, right, the Bible characters. Well, you're actually a Bible character. You're, you're in the Bible right here. You're part of the dead who's going to be judged. You're going to be raised from the dead, and you're going to be judged by God, and he's showing that right here. The dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So if we're judged by these books, we'll rightly be judged and condemned by God because of what we've done, because what, what have we done? Regardless of what we've specifically done, we've fallen short of the glory of God. We've sinned against him. We've broken his law. We deserve his wrath. The only way we escape that is by being in Christ. Having his righteousness credited to our account is the only way that we can be justified and declared to be righteous before God, though we are not, because Christ was righteous in the place of all of his people who truly repent and believe upon him. And that's why it speaks of another book. Another book was opened which is the book of life. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. If your name is not in the book of life, if you're not one of God's people in Christ, and you're seeking to rebel against him, you will suffer uh, eternal punishment for your sin against the eternally holy God, the God of joy and righteousness and peace and love who has created you to function in all those things, though you have rebelled against him and said, no, I'm going to function my way which is a way not of true joy and peace. It's a way of chaos apart from him. And then in the, in the narrative, as I mentioned back in the narrative, that is the last we hear of the blood men. Uh, Mansoul fought with them for a time. Uh, they, uh, Mansoul endured by the grace of their prince. And then in the sovereign plan of King Shaddai, the blood men were surrounded and captured, and that's it. Uh, some received mercy, some didn't, as our God gives mercy to whom he wills, and he hardens whom he wills. And as for Mansoul, we see, just as it is for us, as through our Lord's sufficient grace, we can fight and endure through all things, through him who strengthens us, we can accomplish that which he would have us accomplish 
in our lives. We can endure through that which he sovereignly places in our lives for us to endure through and glorify his name through. And then in finishing this evening's section, Bunyan gives us this story about four of the doubters who fled the battle. So you remember the doubters, they just fled the scene and ran away. Well, four of them actually came back. They came to return and, and to sneak back into Mansoul. One was an election doubter, one was a vocation doubter, one was a salvation doubter, and one, uh, the fourth one was a grace doubter. And in coming back to the city, they made their way to one named Evil Questioning's house, who welcomed them and sympathized with them for all the trouble they had suffered. After some discussion back and forth between Evil Questioning and these doubters, Evil Questioning mentioning that he wished all 10,000 doubters, that whole army, was back and under his command because he, you know, he would bring some real trouble to Mansoul then. While this was going on, we're told that one of uh, Wilby Will's men stood listening outside the window of his house. Uh, this man, Mr. Diligence, uh, so Mr. Diligence is, is, is working uh, very similarly to Mr. Uh, Prywell in his position. Diligently uh, searching, searching the heart, searching the mind to see what needs to be put to death. Well, Mr. Diligence uh, heard everything that was said and reported it back to Will Be Will, who had Diligence taken straight to Evil Questioning's house. And as they made it to the house, the two kicked the door down, catching all of them together, and they took the prisoners to Mr. Truman, the jailer who put them into prison. Just as we've mentioned before, this is taking falsehood captive, not, not letting it linger, not justifying it, taking it captive, taking every thought captive to obedience to Jesus Christ, taking falsehood captive in the mind, dealing with it appropriately, dealing with it in accordance with truth, not letting it linger at all. Now, beloved, we're not to allow falsehood to be in the mind. Evil questioning doubters in any way, they need to go. They have no place in the mind of a, an image bearer of God, much less they have no place in, in the mind of a new creation in Christ Jesus. They need to go. We're told that Will Be Will had the authority to execute these prisoners when he captured them. But he thought at this time in the current circumstances it would be more for the honor of the prince the comfort of Mansoul, and the discouragement of the enemy to hold a public hearing and try the prisoners first. So evil questioning was first put on the stand, and he was instructed to listen to the charges against him, and he would be at liberty to make any objections he may have. The indictment was then read as follows. Mr. Evil Questioning, you are hereby indicted by the name of Evil Questioning. As a Diabolonian intruder in Mansoul, you are accused of supporting the king's enemies and of questioning the truth of this town's doctrine and laws, which evidence is supported by the fact that you wish that 10,000 doubters were resident in Mansoul. You're accused of receiving and harboring this town's enemies who have fled the ranks of their own army. What do you say that, to this indictment? Are you guilty or not guilty? Close quote. To which evil questioning firstly denied that that was even his name. Well, you got the wrong guy. That's not me. I'm not, I'm not evil questioning. As we've seen before with Bunyan bringing this out in different aspects of sin, evil questioning actually says that, that his, his name is actually honest inquiry. I'm not, I'm not evil questioning. I'm not, I'm not uh, wickedly questioning things. I'm just making an honest inquiry. Right? I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to figure things out. Right? So it's a way that you can justify your sin. You call it something else that sounds a lot better. Right, we mentioned this before. The world does this all the time. I'm not actually uh, in, in, in evil, wickedly questioning the truth. I'm just making an honest inquiry. So he, he isn't even the man who is named in the indictment. Further, further he brings out that these men, these, uh, these doubters, uh, who came to his house, uh, they came and he was just showing hospitality and being charitable towards them. I was just giving them a place to stay. Just helping them out. What are you talking about? Well, all of this is cleared up by Will Be Will, who knows that this is evil questioning. They were actually friends when they were under Diabolus, and Will Be Will was a servant of Diabolus before they were redeemed by Prince Emmanuel. Will, they, they were friends. Will Be Will knows who this is. And the witness, Mr. Diligence, clearly heard him say these things. Therefore, as a Diabolonian who housed Diabolonians, uh, Mr. Evil Questioning had really nothing more that he could say. And he held his peace as he was shown to be who he is. 
And then with the doubters, I'm just going to read this part. It says the doubters were called to the stand, and since the election doubter was a foreigner, his charges were translated for him. He was charged with being an enemy of Emmanuel and a hater of Mansoul and the law of the town. He was asked how he would plead. He would only confess that he was an election doubter, and that was the religion he had been brought up in. And if he must die for his religion, then he would die a martyr and could care less. The judge replied that to question election, God's choosing of his people in Christ before the foundation of the world, that he chose them, we, that we, we love him because he loves us. To question election was to overthrow a great doctrine of the gospel, namely the omniscience, omniscience meaning uh, that God knows all, uh, omni meaning all, uh, science meaning knowledge, omniscience, all, the, the fact that God has all knowledge. To question election was to overthrow a great doctrine of the gospel, namely the omniscience, power, and will of God, and to take away the liberty of God over his creatures, and to cause man's soul to stumble in their faith, and to make salvation depend upon works and not upon grace. Because then ultimately, if it's not God choosing us, then it's ultimately us somehow wooing him to have him, to have him change to a position of, oh, now, well, now I want to love them, now I want to, to save them. We're, we're doing something to cause it. It, it. it destroys the liberty of God, the freedom of God, his free grace towards us. We're, then, we're, then we're actually doing something to deserve it. Such questioning also misrepresents the word and disquiets the minds of the people of Mansell. He says it causes them to stumble in their faith. It disquiets their minds. What, what a blessing it is to embrace just the clear teaching of Scripture in God's election. I mean, it, it's, it's just so encouraging. And I mean, there's... I mean, just, just to understand that he who began this work, he started it, he, he chose his people, he's the one who converted it, he started it, and he's going to finish it. To understand that salvation, it, well, as Scripture says many times, salvation is of the Lord, it belongs to the Lord, it's such an encouraging thing for the saints. So many things we can go through in this fallen world, even through our own sin, but yet we can still know <coughs> he's going to finish this work. He chose me, he elected me. He's going to finish it to the praise of his glorious grace. I love Christ. I know that I'm in him. I know that he's chosen me. Such questioning misrepresents the word. It disquiets the minds of the people of Mansell. Therefore, by the best of laws, he must die. Election, election doubter must die. And the reason I somewhat laugh because I'm thinking there, there's so many churches today that question election. If, if they read that, I just wonder what they would think. Um, Bunyan not saying that they themselves should die, but that thought should die, right? The thought should die. But still, to question election, an election doubter must be put to death. There's so many things it goes against. Then the vocation doubter's charges were basically the same as those read to the election doubter, except that he was particularly charged with denying the calling of Mansoul. And the judge asked for his response. He then replied that he never believed that there was any such thing as a distinct and powerful call of God to Mansell. He believed that there was only a general call of the word. This general call was simply an exhortation to keep themselves from evil and do good, and in so doing, they would have the promise of happiness. The judge answered, you're a Diabolonian and have denied a major part of one of the most tested and proven truths of the prince of this town of Mansell. He has called, and this town has heard a most distinct and powerful call of Emmanuel, by which the townspeople have been given new life, understanding, and the desire to have communion with their prince, to serve him and to do his will. By his grace and good pleasure, they look for their happiness. And for your hatred of this good doctrine, you must die. To deny... Essentially, what they're talking about is the effectual calling of God. See, there's different places in Scripture where it is specifically Christians who are called, who are called the called, who are called the called. Um, for example, in Jude's greeting, in the beginning of Jude, this is how he begins his letter. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, 
beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Paul mentions it several times in, in his greeting in, and throughout the letter in 1 Corinthians as well. We are, we are the call. So this isn't the, as he mentioned, the general call. The general call is repent and believe the gospel. Right? That's what Jesus means when he says many are called. That effectual call is when he says but few are chosen. Many are called to repent, but few are chosen. Few are actually effectually called through the gospel and granted new birth to come to Christ. He says, you deny this, you must die. You, de you deny that which gives saints their happiness. You deny that which gives them new life, understanding, and the desire to have communion in their print. See, to, to, to deny the effectual call is to then, I mean, it's still very similarly with the election doubter. It's to deny God's sovereignty and salvation to say it's ultimately upon us. We've done this. No, God has done this work. He's the one who's given us a new heart. He's the one who has called us and not we ourselves. We don't get to, we're not going to get to heaven and, and brag and boast about what we did or even the decision that we made. Oh, I'm so glad I was smarter than that other person. No, we're going to just, what, it's, it's been granted to us as a gift so that no one may boast. We're going to be boasting in him. Look at what he did. He did all of this. He called me. He, he chose me. He called me. He justified me. He glorified me in his presence. It's, it's all of him. It's all boasting in him. If anyone boasts, let them boast in the Lord, not in self. Because in and of ourselves, we're nothing. Scripture, scripture says in Romans 3.11, that in and of ourselves, we become worthless. No one does good. No, not one. None is righteous. No one understands. It's all of him to, to change our very nature and make us a new creation in Christ where we think rightly. We want to live rightly. It's all of him. Anything that, that is contrary to that, uh, any thought that is contrary to that must be put to death. Uh, the grace doubter was called, and his indictment read, uh, he answered that although he was from the land of doubting, his father was the son of a Pharisee and had a good reputation amongst his neighbors. He stated as well that his father had taught him to believe that man's soul would never be saved freely by grace alone. Grace is unmerited favor. Right? Favor that you, you don't merit, you don't, you don't earn. You'll never be saved by that is what the grace doubter says. The judge said, the law of the prince is plain. Neg negatively, not of works. And positively, by grace you are saved. Your religion relies on the works of the flesh. The works of the law are the works of the flesh. Besides, what you have said robs God of his glory and has given that glory to sinful man. You have robbed Christ of the necessity of his work and of the sufficiency of it and have given it to the works of the flesh. Because if you could attain righteousness by your own works, then Jesus died for no reason. Paul says those exact words in, in Galatians. See there at the end of chapter 2 or at the beginning of chapter 3. I think it's at the very end of Galatians 2. Yeah, Galatians 2.21. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, Christ died for no purpose. Furthermore, he says, you have despised the work of the Holy Spirit and have magnified the will of the flesh and of the legal mind. You're a Diabolonian, the son of a Diabolonian, and for your Diabolonian principles, you must die. With this concluding statement of the judges, the jury was sent out for deliberation. They returned with the verdict of guilty and the sentence of death. The recorder, Mr. Knowledge, stood up and addressed the prisoners. You, the prisoners of this town, have hereby been indicted and found guilty of high crimes against the Prince Emmanuel and against the town of Mansoul, for which you were sentenced to death. So these Diabolonians were sentenced to death by the cross. The place of execution was to be where Diabolus had just encamped his army against Mansoul. Only old evil questioning was hanged near his house at the corner of Bad Street. And that's what we're to do with sinful thoughts, church. They're to be crucified. They're to be put to death. We're not to let them linger. We're not to play around with them. We're to put them to death. They're not to live whatsoever. And as far as our time in the Holy War this evening, that's, the far, that's as far as we're getting uh, this evening. As next week is our Reformation Day celebration 
our next time together in this in a couple weeks, we will, uh, by God's grace, Lord willing, we will finish the book. But apart from any comments or questions, we can begin our review.